welcome to On the Media's very first live stream ever. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Joe Baker, a member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Good evening. My name is Sari Kamen. I am the Public Programs Director of MOFAD. And tonight I have the honor of welcoming you to Uncle Nearest, Untold Stories Behind the Whiskey Still. Um, I want to thank the Green Space, first of all, for partnering with us. This has been such a wonderful partnership series that we call Food for Thought. Um, we're now in our six month, I think, working with them. And it's such an honor to be able to present these stories together, especially this evening. It's February, it's Black History Month. So I am so grateful that we have our guests tonight, Fawn Weaver, Garrett Oliver, and Shannon Mustafer, who you'll see a little bit later to tell the story of Uncle Nearest and tell their own stories working in uh, the distilling and spirits industry. Um, for those of you that don't know the Museum of Food and Drink, we are an actual museum. We're based in New York City. We have had everything move online since almost a year from now. We've moved all of our programs to the internet and it's just been absolutely incredible to connect with people um, from all over the country. We have, you know, Fawn tonight coming from Tennessee, such a privilege. We were in, in conversation with her to have her hopefully come to the museum last May before the pandemic. But of course, you know, we all know that didn't happen. We were so excited to show you our, our new exhibition, African slash American Making the Nation's Table. And of course we were not able to open it in March. Um, so we just feel really, really grateful to still be able to share these stories of uh, overlooked African-American culinary figures um, this evening. So thank you so much for supporting us and being with us. So I want to introduce you or have our panelists introduce you this evening. I will start with Fawn Weaver. I am Fawn Weaver and founder and CEO of Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey, also the founder of the Nearest Green Foundation. Thank you, Fawn. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our friend Garrett Oliver who is going to kick off the conversation with Fawn. Uh, we do have Shannon Mustafer with us this evening as well. She's gonna make a, a cocktail or two uh, in the middle of the show. So we'll meet up with her later, but Garrett's gonna kick things off and start the conversation with Fawn. So thank you again so much for being here and enjoy the show. Hello everyone. My name is Garrett Oliver and I am the brewmaster of Brooklyn Brewery uh, here in New York City on the author of the Brewmaster's Table, and the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Companion to Beer. Now, you might be wondering, why did they get a brewer to come here and talk about whiskey? But, ah, we have secrets. <laughs> I am a geek, okay? I'm a total cocktail geek, and I was, uh, you know, taught by many of the best of them out there. I have an attitude. Uh, I have a large liquor collection. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a place uh, called Harlem Hops, and a friend of mine named Tanya Hopkins uh, introduced me to Uncle Nearest Whiskey. And I was, to tell you the truth, uh, I, had, I had not heard of it. I had heard of the legend, as it was at the time, of Nearest Green. And I was amazed at how great the whiskey actually was. 
And it's my great pleasure uh, to be here this evening to talk to Fawn Weaver about her whiskey, where it comes from, uh, Nathan Green, Nearest Green, and his background, and the background of African Americans uh, in the American whiskey story. And that is certainly an, an untold story. So, uh, you know, welcome and, and thanks for having me uh, here to talk to you, Fawn. Thank you for having me. Let me tell you, Harlem Hops, first of all, I am hiding all of these things that I'm looking at myself. I just keep going through and just hiding self-view because I, I think we're creating a narcissistic generation with this whole Zoom thing. So I'm like, hide self-view. So I am just looking at you. Good. Uh, that's a good, that's a good move. <laughs> I, I, I am not, no. I'm not looking at either of us. No. I <laughs> Well, I'm hoping that you're that you don't keep moving around because I keep seeing screens move, and I'm like, no, Garrett, stay right where you are. So nobody move the screen. Uh, no, I, I Harlem hops. This is the interesting thing about Harlem hops. Harlem hops was one of our first big supporters in New York. Now, mind you, I'm in Tennessee. It's premium whiskey, right? We're a sixty dollar bottle. We later introduced a fifty dollar bottle, but we're at a $60 bottle and everyone keeps telling me about Harlem hops. I'm going, why does a place that serves <laughs> beer, why does this hit our radar so high? And then I met that crew and I was like, yeah. this is why. I mean, these, they are incredible human beings. And my, <laughs> my husband and my assistant come back from Harlem hops after going to it for the first time. And they come back and they just can't stop talking about it. And I'm like, well, what did you eat? We had empanadas and pretzels. <laughs> well, I, I went up menu? there. They asked me to come up there. And it's like, um, it was a Saturday in summertime. <laughs> and people are talking to me, to me about the beach. And I'm in Brooklyn. And if you are not in New York City, Brooklyn's a long way from Harlem, especially yeah. that part of Harlem, which is a little bit west. And I was like, this is going to take me a long time. I'm not going to be outdoors in the sunshine. I'm going to be inside talking to people in July or August, you know, it's not what I want, but you know, they seem like great people. And I went up there to, uh, to meet up with them and I had a ball and they mm -hmm. were throwing down so hard, uh, the very best, uh, of everything. And this is where the whiskey comes in. Many people don't realize that the, the process of making whiskey essentially, starts, essentially with starts with making beer. Yes. You make the beer first yeah. and then you distill the beer. So yeah. I had heard of nearest grain for many years, but it's almost like it was the Loch Ness monster or something. <laughs> it was, you know, you'd heard of it the way that people 20 or 30 years ago had heard of the Hemings family. Yeah. Um, and they knew it was passed down in families. People talked about it. Researchers like uh, David Wondrich, you know, had talked about it. Um, and we knew, of course, that we were distillers but we have been left entirely. When I say we, I mean African-Americans have been left out of the story as we have been left out of the story of so many things and so many things to which we were actually central to the story. Absolutely. And you know, uh, when the New York Times article that you talk about came up, uh, I was fascinated, but you actually went and did something. I did. I did. So I read the same article that everyone else did. But I, I think that I gravitated to a few interesting elements. It's a little bit like, did you did you see the article that came out, I want to say a couple of days ago, where the archaeologists in Egypt have now found the oldest. <laughs> I think 40 brewery? people said that to me. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's so, it's so exciting to me because I think that what we're doing, and, and I think every group of people, when you look at it, others did not uncover their history. When you look at the stories that have been told, they have generally been told by people of their own race, right? And so we are now starting to uncover our history because we're diving into it. It's everyone has their own opinions on it. My opinion is it's our responsibility to learn our stories and to tell our stories. And so something like that, I cannot wait to see who dives into that and really gets that going now that we know 5,000 years ago, there's a major brewery in Africa. That is just- well, And not only was there major breweries, I mean, the Egyptians, by the time of the ancient Egyptians, 
Thebes was built on beer money. They had advertising, they had brand names, they had everything. And in every single African society, east to west, north to south, there is a strong brewing tradition at the center of every village. If you're in South Africa, it's Nkumboti. If you're in Congo, it's Bilbil. It'll be made from millet, it'll be made from sorghum, it'll be made from barley. But this is part of the tradition um, that, is, uh, that is central to traditional African life. But they say in Africa uh, that until lions have their own historians, the tales of the hunt will be told from the perspective of the hunt. Always. The and, victor and, and always so, tells the story. The victor writes the history. And it becomes a place of needing to be able to define our own history. But the thing is, is that when you're bringing forth something, and this was the case with the story of Nears Green, when you're bringing forth a story that is not uh, known, that is about a group of people that are, we're, we're now what, 13.9% of the population, right? And so we've got a whole, a, a, a large number out there that is a, not a part of us. We've got, you know, 85.1, right? That is not us. And so you have 85.1 being a part of telling the story. And now we are really getting serious, I think, about telling our own story. So for me, when I saw that newspaper article that everyone else saw, so it's very interesting to just kind of see what happened. I was in Singapore, of all places. And I in love Singapore, Singapore, I love Singapore. Let me tell you, I love it. But in Singapore, you on the cover of the New York Times International Edition was this headline. And then there was this huge picture. And I think that in the US, it was on the cover of the food section. But in Singapore, that was the headline. That was the cover story. And I remember seeing it. And I think a lot of people missed uh, something that I pulled from it, which was if you just looked at the article, if you just looked at the title, you could very quickly turn it into clickbait and make assumptions and really make leaps that the story itself did not make. The story was very simple. Clay Risen did took a, a bit of oral history and in Lynchburg and then went and talked to a few folks and tried to fill in some things, but he didn't have the time to really dig in in terms of really doing the research. The one thing I'm sure you know about small towns is, is good luck doing research if you are not an insider. Oh, they absolutely. absolutely. They and uh, you need to, you know, you need to be going to uh, town halls and whatever else. And this is a good point at which maybe uh, uh, everybody in, in, in charge here to put up that uh, graphic, you know, that, uh, that David Wondrich was good enough to, uh, to share with us um, because it tells a little bit of the, uh, you know, of the tale that we're about to uh, talk about. Do we have that, as they say, you know, on the radio? <laughs> well, if not, they'll put it up, they'll, they'll put it up in a minute, but we have a, you yeah, know, we have a, a, a graphic and I'm sure you know David Wondrich. Uh, okay, here it is. Um, this is from a set of censuses uh, from uh, the South. And if uh, you know, if you want to, I don't know how this shows up on your monitor. But all these people here are from various Southern states, starting in 1810 and through about 1917. These are. African Americans listed as Negro or colored who are listed in the census as distillers. Yeah. So okay. here's the, so here's these, the, these are just the people who were captured as distillers, some of them enslaved beforehand, and then some of them you're not quite sure, and some of them clearly free. But you see the number of names up there, um, and you realize that. Uh, Nearest Green is a prominent name that came down to us through history, but the same way that uh, the Hemings family is indicative of the fact that most African Americans have 25% European heritage genetically. Uh, all of these things were blended together, and that's just not the story of one family, the story of many families. But you know what we're here to talk about, though, is the, is is Nearest story. Um, yeah. And so let's, uh, you know, let's dive into that. I think, uh, I think you got a film you want to show us. I do. 
I think All right. someone. <laughs> well, roll it. I, I, you know, I don't know. I will say I do want that slide. I would love that slide. Oh, but, yeah. But also the thing, the thing to look out for is that a lot of the distillers as enslaved people would not have been listed in the census as a distiller. They were no. listed as farmers. Yes. And so that number is much greater than what we may have just shown by far, uh, because if you look at Nearest Green, he was never listed as a distiller. His children and grandchildren that were distillers were not listed as a distiller, but guess what? Neither was Jack Daniel. They were all yeah. listed in the census as farmers. And so that, that number is, is quite great. And it's part of, it was part of household management. You yeah. ran, you ran a brewery mm -hmm. uh, at the same time as you ran a kitchen, at the same time as you ran a bakery, at the same time as you ran a butcher shop, at the same time as you were actually out in the fields. When you talked about uh, all of the founding fathers talking about that they brewed beer, George Washington brewed beer, and we have his recipe, et cetera. Well, when you read the letters from Jefferson to Madison about beer and about brewing and about distilling, they talk about well, my man did this and my man did that. My yeah. man, my man, yes. my man. And so yeah. they did, they did not make anything. No, like nothing. <laughs> you know, did they yeah. lay their hands actually on? And so you find that uh, uh, not only were African uh, uh, Americans making all the food, they were making almost all the whiskey. They were making almost all the beer until yes. the point got in history where you could make the money. Right. right. And then well, yeah. it gets stripped. I, well, and I think that if you actually go back and you look at in time, which by the way, Garrett, I have to tell you how much fun this is for me to be talking to you because usually I am the person who knows the history, who has done, and it's so much fun for me to listen to you. <laughs> You have really done your 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 homework, your research. This is what you do, and it's very rare that I get to have conversations like this. So thank you, thank oh, you. For same your... same here. Believe me, this is a I lot mean, of I'll, fun. I'll tell you a quick story, and this this will this is indicative, and and it and it really comes down like when you look at okay, women cooking in the home, but as soon as it turns to leisure, then it's men cooking. As soon as it turns to money, it's men cooking in Scotland. You know, in medieval times, there was a limit on how much barley a woman could could buy. And the reason for it was, was that there are a lot of women going around. And this was at the time the only way, one of the very few ways that a woman could make, if she didn't have a husband, there was a it was a way that you could make a perfectly honest living. And so if you had women going around buying large amounts of barley and they would then be able to make their own beer, they wouldn't need men. So what they did was they just said, this is the maximum amount of barley that you can even buy. Because no. we, don't, we don't, yes, because we don't need any of y'all going and deciding that like, you don't need to have a man in the house and in your so, life. So can and, I tell you something that's so crazy when it comes to men, because we focus on color so much, right? We're talking about the, and the pieces that a lot of people miss is people of color got the right to vote before women did. People, people oh, yeah. of color got so many rights before women. And where that really, that point was driven home was in here in, in Shelbyville where I am, but right down the road, you've got, my distillery is this way, right? Straight down the road. And Jack Daniel distillery is literally equal distance that way. Well, right next to Lynchburg is a lot of Nearest's descendants are there in Tullahoma. And they, they, that family that grew up, this current generation that grew up working at Jack Daniel Distillery after Prohibition. So a lot of people don't know that Tennessee went into Prohibition 10 years before federal Prohibition. And it was the last state to come out and we came out county by county. And so literally you had 11, 12 years where nothing was being distilled down here in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And so that family did not, I mean, the business went away, right? So a part of Nearest's family went with Jack up to St. Louis. And until I got up there and actually took them to the Jack Daniel distillery where it relocated in St. Louis, they had no idea why their entire branch was up there. And I literally had to take them to the distillery, which at least I got to do it 
literally right before it got taken down. It's now no longer there, but it had been there as a vacant, very large sort of warehouse space for, for some time. But my point is, is that the, the family here uh, did not have money. And it was very confusing to them because when I was doing all the research, I show that Nears Green is the wealthiest African-American in the, in the area immediately following the Civil War. He's wealthier than a lot of the white people around him, his neighbors, all the rest of that. His children, his grandchildren all had a lot of land. They all were successful and they couldn't understand. And they kept asking me, well, what happened to the money? What happened? And so there was like one branch of the family that was successful in one branch and I couldn't figure out what happened to the money. And so they kept posing this question. I kept trying to figure out why is one fam, one branch sort of successful and one isn't. And so I'm having a conversation with one of Neris's descendants in Texas. And I, rem I will never forget this because this, this question was driving me crazy because I didn't have an answer. And uh, I posed it to her and she says, well, that's easy. I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, well, I know that answer. I said, well, what's the answer? And she said, you, the family that had the money were the children of George Green. So Nearest's son, George, that's the one who's in the picture that they just showed. These children are all children of Nearest Green or through George Green, right? That's the money, that's the prominence. And so then the question was this family that's in Tullahoma, that's been working at Jack Daniel Distillery for the last few generations, why did they not have money? And she said, well, "Where, where? Uh, the, the thing I'm wondering is, you hear like, okay, the end of the Civil War, uh, you know, the family has money. How, as an enslaved man, which Nearest Green was, mm -hmm. um, how did he end up with any money in the first place? Did he start to uh, be able to make money as a distiller immediately at the end of the Civil War? I'm sure that as an enslaved person." He didn't have money. So, uh, you know, yes. I, I'd like to hear how that even happened in the yeah. first place in that area. Well, yes and no, because the, the thing about enslaved people is for a lot of the owners uh, and Dan Call, the property where both he and Jack Daniel worked, right? They both worked for the same man. Jack is a very young chore boy turned orphan. And then you had Nears Green as an enslaved man versus both working for Dan Call. Well, if you look at the record books for Dan Call, a lot of people confuse this because his name is D.H. Call, Daniel Houston Call, but so was his uncle. Well, his uncle owned slaves. That's on the record books. If you look at D.H. Call, he doesn't own any slaves. He never owned any slaves, which means that the enslaved people on that property would have been rented, right? Now, for a lot of very, very skilled, uh, whether that is, and you saw this a lot with distillers, you also saw this with blacksmith, those that were incredibly uh, skilled and labor intensive, you would see them being rented out because they were too costly to buy. That's the first thing. However, for a lot of these guys, they would be paid bonuses. So if their work was great, you had this sort of set amount that they were required to make and anything over that, they received a bonus. The problem is, is none of this stuff is in record. So it's impossible for us to know. Dan Cole's family, I've spent a lot of time with them and they're like, well, isn't it possible that he was a free man on the property? I said, it is possible. The problem is it's also possible that he wasn't. And I am not going to, to err to the side of him being a free man unless somebody can prove some, doc have some documents. Yeah, yeah because that wasn't the norm. So I'm not going to allow for that story to be retold unless someone can show me. But we do know that, that many of the enslaved people, if they were incredibly skilled at what they did, especially if what they were producing was making their, their, their owners or those who were renting them money, they would bonus them. So that's one option. Uh, but we also have to look at the, you had a four year gap, right? Between the end of, of slavery and the time we're first seen in the census. Yes. And so well, I mean, we, you know, a lot of these people, they had their land stripped away thereafter. So you wouldn't even know necessarily 50, 60 years later that they had had land, they had had money, they had had anything. 
And then, of course, if that becomes part of the history, then you would seem like you have to treat them right. But let's go back. Let's have a look at, uh, you know, we have a, a short clip of a film kind of showing, setting this all up, looking at some of the photos that you, uh, you dug up uh, uh, and uh, just giving people a flavor of what we're going to talk about. And then I want to talk about how you actually make the whiskey and what makes Tennessee whiskey in Nares Green style. But let's take a look. June 26, 2016, the New York Times did a story indicating Jack Daniels may have been started with the help of a slave. There was little proof to go on, so I got on a plane and flew 1,800 miles to Lynchburg, Tennessee. This single act of ambitious curiosity would reveal my destiny and change the course of my life forever. Six states and many months of research later, with the assistance of more than 20 historians, researchers, archivists, and genealogists, and more than 10,000 documents and original artifacts reviewed, we had pieced together the story of Nathan Nearest Green, the world's first known African-American master distiller. With the help of Nearest Green and Jack Daniel descendants, we launched our brand, Uncle Nearest premium whiskey. We pounded the pavement city by city, preaching this history and pouring our delicious whiskey. Our ragtag crew assembled organically, rapidly from all parts of the world, spirit industry veterans and newcomers alike. As our story spread, more and more amazing humans wanted to be a part of our larger mission. We were and will always be stewards of a legacy. Well, that's pretty, that was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, but the thing is like, okay, uh, I think it's time for everybody to open up their whiskey. If you have your uncle nearest whiskey, uh, it's, it's time to open it up. I got, you know, I like to be, you know, I'd like to take my drinking seriously. So I got my little glass uh, right here. It's time to open it up. What makes Tennessee whiskey different? Now, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to cause a, a ruckus here. But I have to admit that I am more familiar with bourbon. I know uh, that there is obviously a, uh, a technique of filtering through, uh, through charcoal. But what, where does this all come from? What makes Tennessee whiskey Tennessee whiskey? And what is it that Nearest in particular uh, gave uh, to the Daniels family in that regard? Absolutely. So first, I'm going to go back to what I was I was talking about before, because I think that got that got interrupted. And I don't want anyone out there sitting there going, well, what was the difference? Why did one side of the family not have money? So I, I want to finish that. Uh, the reason is, is Nearest had two sons that had his entire lineage and one son only had daughters. Okay. Nothing passed down to the girls. So the answer to why did one side of Nearest's lineage have money and continue success and wealth and the other didn't was not because of color, it was because of gender. And 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 so you see that in, you see that in France, you know, in winemaking country, if you go to Bordeaux, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you go to Burgundy, just chopped up into tiny little parcels as the families get older and older, hundreds of years it's like these sons get this and that son gets this and this son gets and the thing gets subdivided, subdivided, subdivided until everybody's got like 800 square feet to grow their <laughs> that to grow their their vines in. Yeah. So the, 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 sto the story essentially, as I understand it, is that, you know, one nearest greens whiskey was amazing. And he taught a technique that basically made this whiskey better and yeah. passed that down. And, and so what what was it? Yeah, so you're biased towards knowing more about bourbon. Uh, the, the first thing is, is that Tennessee whiskey is a straight bourbon whiskey. So you can love it just ah. like your bourbons. The legal definition is no different. The only difference between the bourbon you're familiar with and Tennessee whiskey is the process near screen taught. And it is taking a traditional bourbon, meaning the distillate, pre-going into the barrel, and you're running it through charcoal filtration. Now, what those in Lynchburg, the enslaved people in Lynchburg, 
The charcoal mellowing process, we see it in Kentucky in the 18th century. That did not begin here. But what we see in Lynchburg and what Jack's descendants specifically credited the enslaved people of Lynchburg and those who were working for nearest, around nearest, is actually utilizing sugar maple charcoal as what they were filtering through. So that those properties change it a little bit. But truly, the only difference between what they do in Kentucky and what we do down here is taking the exact same distillate. It has to be 51% corn, has to go into new American oak charred barrels. All those things are the same. The only difference is this process that nears green tot, which we've now been able to track back to West Africa. So if you go to West Africa, even to this day, 95% of the trees that are chopped down are for wood fuel, and for charcoal, specifically for filtering their water and their fermented drinks and for purifying foods. So here, these enslaved people come here, they taste this bourbon, which I have to imagine without having a filtration was like a little harsh going down. So I just imagine the enslaved people tasting it for their masters and going, what are y'all drinking? Let's help you out here. That's how I envision it, uh, what went on. But the truly, the difference is, is, is prior to it going into the barrel, it has about a six and a half month additional process than you're going to find up in Kentucky. And- the Is the barrel itself actually charred in the, you know, to the extent that a lot of uh, bourbon barrels are charred because- They're uh, identical. Yeah, identical. So you, you, you not only have the, the, the actual filtration, the carbon filtration, of the distillate, but then you also have that motion uh, back and forth through the char layer uh, over the seasons as the the wood breathes in and out. Exactly. Uh, you're going you're you're going to be clearing that up. I can tell you, you know, a uh, a quick, well, funny and, and vaguely tragic story. Um, uh, you know, we are all familiar with uh, malt liquor, which you know in the '60s and '70s became a sort of socially racialized form of beer and it was really really quite horrible stuff i mean uh Eight very rough, roughly and quickly fermented from very cheap materials and i saw i was in a plant once and saw you know uh, a filtration going on it's like what's going on and there's a little window like this and you can see the beer running through but intermittently there was this black puff 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 you know that the window would go black for a second then back to golden then black and I was like, what's going on there? It's like, oh, we're running malt liquor. We're like, well, what's the, you know, I'm familiar with filtration. What's that? And the guy's like, mm -hmm. but he's like, what? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, what, what, what are you doing? It's like, it's activated carbon. It's like, why are you putting activated carbon into the filtration feed? It's like, well, you know, if we didn't, nobody could drink it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, that is what, that, that is what, you know, was being sold. You know, stuff that was so rough, you know, that they literally had to put, you know, carbon, extra carbon, just like bolted into the filter, you know, to clean it up. But in this case, you have something which might have started off essentially as moonshine or obviously it did. It's new mixed spirit. Yep. It's coming through your your char and then it's kind of going through the normal process of seasons. So how many seasons does Uncle Nearest Whiskey have? And what are you doing, you know, when it comes to your, your, to selecting your oak? You know, I've never counted the number of seasons. Let's see, it's going through a number of seasons. So if, if you're looking at the 1884, I guess technically that goes through 28 seasons. Uh, <laughs> but, but if you're just counting summer and winter, it's going through 14 uh, of the seasons. But here in Tennessee, we do not, I, I can't speak for everyone. I can say for Uncle Nearest, we do not use temperature controlled warehouses. Right. Rick houses are as they, they were. And our Rick houses are one story. When Nearest Green yeah. was alive okay. and when Jack Daniel were, was alive, both of them never stored barrels higher than one story. That is all they had. And so you had them putting, you had Nearest putting the whiskey in at 110 and intentionally proofing it down. So the amount of water that's having to be added to Uncle Nearest, I 
believe is very similar to the amount of water that had to be added to what Nearest Green was releasing from the barrels. That's fully intentional. So when we release whiskey from our barrels, anywhere between 99 proof and 102, 103 proof is about the average. So when you're drinking our 1856, it, that at 100 proof is as close as you're going to get to barrel strength without paying barrel strength prices. And our uh, that, that 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 is a that is a fine economy. That, yes, that, it is. That I, I would like to you know to 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 you know. Well, we we always knew like there were there were always those ones uh, uh, you know some rye whiskeys that you knew they were bottled in bond. And even before I knew anything about whiskey, you know, you're like, wait a minute, that's like that's a hundred proof. Yeah. And these other ones are you know and yeah yes and. Uh, makes very good drinks. Um, yeah. I just want to get into a couple of things here. Uh, one is, okay, we start off with Moonshine. People are familiar with Moonshine. And Moonshine really has an air of illegality about it. But I found out uh, well after my grandfather died that during Prohibition, he had brewed beer. He had brewed beer like every week. And this is Years before I became a brewer, you know, he died. He died in 1980. I became a brewer uh, uh, professionally in 1989. And I would just love to have talked to him about like what it was, you know, that he did. And there were, you know, never mind uh, the difference between enslaved, not enslaved, etc. There were so many moonshiners uh, that were down there as well. Every time there was a way to make some money, everybody uh, was in it. But when you think of a moonshiner, you know, you think of a stereotype, which is not, is not us. I'm going to read a little, you know, short clip here from Teresa McCullough, who is a beer historian for the Smithsonian and talking about brewing in this case. Most of us are familiar with the image of the immigrant uh, German entrepreneur who arrives in America and begins to brew lager beer, she says. To a certain extent, that's where our collective memory of brewing history begins. But the original brewers in America were certainly indigenous people. And in our early history as colonies and as a nation, it was often women and enslaved people who were the brewers in the household. Brewing was uh, very much a domestic chore and there was nothing glamorous about it. Now, you know, we have, I can remember easily when bourbon, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, bourbon, people didn't talk about bourbon the way they talk about bourbon now. And as, as these things become ennobled uh, in the minds of society, uh, they move further and further in the public mind away from the, you know, away from the rest of the population uh, and towards only European Americans and that whole history becomes something other than 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 what it was. And I think that you know the story of Nearest is uh, is really important in that regard. Um, there must have been many people making moonshine, et cetera. Are is anybody working on a book about this? Now I don't want to make more work for you. I have written books. <laughs> Lord knows I don't <laughs> have the, it's a terrible, I don't terrible have the time. Disease. I do. I am nearest green. That is my focus. Cementing his name in the history books for every future generation. That is my focus. So I trust that there will be others who will do the same. But I, I have a singular focus. I will say that. I think we all have different things in life we're called to. And this for me, I, I'm very clear about what it is I'm supposed to be doing with this. And when I look at books, when I look at movies, when I look at anything that is entertainment, very little of that lasts beyond a generation. And I am looking at Johnny Walker, Jack Daniel, Jim Beam. We're still talking about them, not because there's a book. We're still talking about them because we're still drinking their liquor. It's still every, it's, it is advertisement of their name everywhere you go. So I'm very clear about what is most important to make sure the, the legacy of Nears Green is cemented. First and foremost is that juice being excellent every single time it goes into our bottles so that we are living up to his legacy of excellence. That is now, important. How do you actually, here's a, here's a question I have. And uh, uh, now as you 
you know, as you've heard, I have, you know, I started over the summer uh, a foundation uh, for to basically teach brewing and distilling uh, skills to people of color, you know, in the United States. So it's called the Michael James Jackson Foundation for Brewing and Distilling. And basically we're giving scholarships to people of color for technical education in brewing and distilling. And one thing that I have found is that there is not much distilling education in the United States. There's lots of brewing education. You know, we have 8,000 breweries uh, and, you know, probably there are 50, 60,000 people at least that make their, uh, make their living actually brewing beer. And that doesn't even include the people who are bottling the beer, filtering the beer, et cetera, et cetera. This is just the brewers. So uh, when it came time to do your, you know, your own distilling, you know, who did you recruit as your distiller? Are you the distiller? How did this <laughs> distiller actually get, you know, uh, get trained? How, yeah. how have, what, because what we found was that, hmm, you look into the brew house, you look into the distilling house and you don't see any African-Americans. Well, why is this? Then you go and look at a brewing education, uh, which at the low end might be $9,000 for a long course or at the high end, uh, uh, 15, 16, $17,000. And then you look at the fact that African-Americans, at least in the United States, have uh, less than about 10% of the assets of European Americans, which means that when they lay out that $15,000, there is no background, there's no family money, they've, people have been redlined, they've had no opportunity to make wealth, um, and therefore, you know, they have been excluded from exactly the thing that they brought to the culture, the same thing that we've seen in music, the same thing we've seen in so many other areas. It's like the ability to make money from this was stripped away. And part of the equity, I think, is giving people the ability to do that again, which is why we're teaching technical, we're giving technical education so that people of color can go and become distillers and brewers. And we're not just going to be requiring experience because with fewer than 1% of people in brew houses and distilleries being of color, you say, I need three years of experience. Well, then who are you going to get? There's nobody there. So yeah. <laughs> there's a chicken and egg thing. So, so where, where, where are you getting your distilling knowledge from? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things in what you just said. First off, there there has never been an accredited distilling degree in this country. And the nearest green school of distilling is the first one that will be accredited to do that. So we rolled that out, uh, gosh, I think we announced that about a, a year ago along with the president of Motlow State College here in Tennessee. And we have been working on the accreditation for that. Almost every single thing has been approved. You've got to get several approvals along the way. And pretty much along the way, everything has been approved. So we just got word a few weeks ago that the program and the, the curriculum that has been that we crafted has been approved. So we're happy camper. So that will Congratulations. I, I want to send you some people. <laughs> <laughs> if you send them to Tennessee, we'll we'll be we'll be ready to rock and roll here. But we are going to begin filling that pipeline in terms of this particular brand, in terms of Uncle Nearest, the way that this came together is not like a, a normal type of brand. And I think it's really important to understand that. This is lightning in a bottle, what we're seeing with Uncle Nearest. And, and so when you're looking at that brand, when you're looking at our growth, when you are looking at us going from no stores to 21,000 locations, when you're looking at us being the fastest growing independent American whiskey brand in US history, that's not putting black in front of it. That's not people of color in front of it. That's period. And I, I do believe that there are greater works at play here that have been uh, making sure and sort of conspiring to make sure that Nearest Green's name is, is permanently written in the history books. But for our brand, we're fortunate that the person who is most experienced in Tennessee whiskey, the person who trained and hired the uh, most recent distiller for Jack Daniel Distillery, Jeff Arnett, 
His predecessor trained him, Jimmy Bedford, and the current AGM for Jack Daniel hired and trained. That's actually who I tapped to write the other half of the curriculum, along with our director of whiskey operations, Sherry Moore. Well, the, the thing going back to gender is Sherry was, I mean, she's a descendant of Jack Daniel. So what you have working on uh, Uncle Nearest and perfecting that product is you have fifth generation master, uh, fifth generation Nearest Green distiller, uh, fifth generation Nearest Green descendant, the Victoria Edie Butler as our master blender. And then you have descendant on Jack's side who is more skilled and more experienced in Tennessee whiskey than anybody else alive, Sherry Moore, and that who is doing that. Well, let's talk about flavors. Now you have a few different cuts and people are curious as to the differences between uh, your uh, your different uh, uh, you know iterations. Well, you know, the, the, you have 1856, is that, the, is, that the, is that the one or are there others, you know, that oh, are yeah. on their way? I can might, I might have gotten behind, wrong. Can you see this behind me? Uh, I can Let see me, it, but I can't zoom in on it. Can you what see that? All right, so those are all of our expressions are up there. And what you have, now that I've adjusted the camera, let me move it back. So I think you have 1884, 1856, and 1820. Yeah, those are our main those are our main expressions. We also have the 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 unicorn that we only release in the UK that is up there. But yes, 1820 is the UK gets a unicorn? I get no unicorn. Let me tell you UK why the, let me tell you why the UK <laughs> gets a unicorn is because uh we did not I did not want to put a Nathan Green bottle into the US. And the reason for that is Everyone who loved and respected him called him Uncle Nearest, his family, his friends. And when you look at his children's, their legal documents, whether that's birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, they refer to him as Nearest. When Nearest was alive, he referred to himself as Nearest. So I had to ask myself, why did he not refer to himself as Nathan? And why did no one else refer to him by the legal name? I don't have that answer. What I do know is the most well-known Nathan in this area is Nathan Bedford Forrest. I know that name. Yes, as I you should. So the, the, the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and he traded at least a thousand slaves a year in this area. And no, so, imagine, imagine if your name was Adolf. There were a lot of people named Adolf, oh, you know, at, at one time. Yeah. Not, not so popular a name anymore. No, not at all. So, so the Nathan Green bottle, we did not want people start calling him Nathan because we believe that there is a reason he and his children chose to not call him Nathan. Uh, but at the same time, I'm adjusting this back since I, I changed it. At the same time, we had to protect the trademark and make sure that no one else was going to be trying to put out a bottle under Nathan Green and then further confusing it. And so that's why we do the drop in the UK, sell a few back into the US. It's solely to protect the, the trademark. So that's the reason that, for that unicorn, don't worry. <laughs> okay, that, that, that makes sense if it's only like a labeling unicorn. Well, tell us about our flavors here. Tell us about yes, you know, so the flavors 18, of, our, of the whiskey. 1820 is our barrel strength. That is our US based unicorn. You can only get that at the distillery. When we do do an online drop every now and again, it, you, it number one, it always creates a frenzy and it's usually sold out in less than a minute. The entire barrel, it literally goes and, and that's it. So 1820 is a minimum of 11 year old and it is always barrel strength. The reason why it's less than 1% of our barrels are candidates for 1820 is because, as I mentioned earlier, our barrels, when we release, we are intentionally proofing down. So almost none of our barrels proof above 108. Well, the only way you get to be a candidate for the 1820 bottle is it has to be an anomaly. It had to proof at 108 or above, which means it went against the grain for our product. And in addition to that, we have a tasting panel that then tastes it. And if we do not believe that it will be double gold, it doesn't go in 1820. Now, what does double gold mean? Is that a competition? Uh... Yeah. Double gold, meaning if it will not take the top award at every competition, 
it does not go into our bottle. So one of the reasons why 1820 sweeps all of the chairman's trophies and the double golds and all the rest of that is because we, we literally created that bottle specifically for that. But all of our juice is excellent. And so each expression is a little different. If it is not going into the 1820 bottle and it is between eight year old and 14 year old and it is blended, that is going into 1856. Very little water is being put into that. And so you've got that at 100 proof. So 1820 is barrel strength, 1856, different age bracket. That one is uh, at 100 proof. And then you have our 1884. This is Victoria blend, Victoria Edie Butler's blend, our master blender, Nears Green's great, great granddaughter. She has a sweeter palate. And so those who have 1884 that are tasting it, you are going to find very heavy notes of vanilla and butterscotch and toffee and caramel and all those things that are my favorite uh, flavors to have when I am drinking a whiskey. That is what you're predominantly going to find in her blend. Because if she gets something that's very oaky or something that you taste the tannins, she <laughs> she's like, nope, give that to 1856. My 1884, she's very clear about what she wants and her palate is phenomenal. And so that is what you're getting in 1884. Now, 1884 is a minimum of seven-year-old. I can say that the 1884 that we're bottling right now is between eight and nine, but for the most part, it is going to be somewhere right about that seven-year mark on the 1884. So the different expressions, the reason why they taste so different is number one, they've been aged at a different Time. So you know for every additional season that it is sitting in there for the summer, those barrel staves, they expand, that whiskey goes into the grooves, pulls out all that sugar, and then sits when it contracts during the winter. So every time that happens, you've got between 1884 and 1856, you have an additional, at least an additional few seasons that it has done that contracting and expanding process. So that is why the each expression tastes different, but they're all, they're all excellent. Uh, so are they all, are they all essentially the same recipe of a new make spirit? Oh, absolutely. We're not, we're not, we're not changing the recipe. Everything from day one, not only everything that we have sourced, but everything that we've laid down ourselves, all the same recipe. And, and we do not intend on changing that. We did play with laying down a recipe that was an original Lynchburg recipe that involved corn malt. And it's, it's, it's good. It's actually quite good, but it wasn't as good as what we're already using. And so that's one of those things where you look at it and go, eh, you know, it's cool. It's got a great story. But the way that we see Mint Nearest's legacy is that juice in that bottle has to be better than most of the juice out there. And so that's always, that's always our focus. Well, it's always fascinating to look back at books and see how people made, you know, their reputations and how far, you know, their reputations would uh, would actually uh, follow. And when you look at old British brewing books, what you find is that the oldest serious brewing books are written actually by butlers. Um, and they are a butler took care of everything in the house, including the house brewery and the bread. I'm sure it was the same with the celeries. So you would have this article at the table, the, the, the estate might essentially virtually own the surrounding towns. They own the pubs in the towns. They provided the beer to there. And they also, and they wrote about this, they provided the beer to the servants. And they talked about how it was very important to make sure that the house beer was very good. You know, because if the house beer wasn't good, then your servants will go out uh, into the community, maybe to pubs that you don't own, which will, they'll end up ruining their morals, you know, and basically keep everybody home by making sure the beer is so good. They don't want to go anyplace else. <laughs> and the whole thing is like you would, when you found that somebody, somebody else's butler made great beer, you would then poach the butler and you, you know, you were not only looking for the cooking, but you were also looking for the beer making skills. And I'm sure that that kind of thing was also, uh, you know, part of, you know, of, of the history down there, especially after the war, when you had people out there that had these skills and they start getting names for themselves uh, for an extraordinary level of skill, because they're, you know, one thing you see in a lot of craft whiskey, and you can certainly speak to it. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, throw any shade on anybody, but, 
you know, you get a lot of craft whiskey out there. They are like, you know, you got this, you know, you got this cute looking 200 milliliter flask uh, <laughs> and, you know, your stuff is a little hazy, and, you know, and like, and if you, and if you took it and took it up to a 750 uh, uh, level, that would be like a hundred dollar bottle. And, you know, the quality isn't there. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that it was important, you know, it, I can certainly, I mean, I'll tell you when I, when I saw a new brand coming out, and I first tasted Uncle Nearest, I was surprised at how yeah. good it was. Because what you find yeah. is that it's the opposite of like craft beer. In many cases, I hate to say it, but the new guys are simply not as good as the folks who have been doing it for 100 years. Yeah. Whereas well, it, in, in craft beer, we thought at least our stuff tasted better. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we, are, we have been laser beam focused from day one that we knew the story was incredible. We knew the story would be captivating. We knew that people would stand up and cheer for the story. And usually when you have a story that is this great, what ends up happening is that the juice suffers. It's, it's usually one or the other. Either you have a good juice that people have added a or embellished a story in order to be able to market it, or you have a great story and the juice is subpar. And I so, call I call that tavern on the green syndrome. If you, know, <laughs> if, you know, if you know if you know the New York restaurant that had this beautiful tableau and it looked out on Central Park, you get that great view. You know, it's like, mm, uh, you know, uh, you, you gotta wonder how good the food's gonna be because they don't have to work that hard. Absolutely, and, that, and, that's the same, and it's the same thing about you know uh, uh, about a story. Um, well, I mean. Uh, you know, Shannon Mustafer was supposed to be here uh, with us. She had technical issues. We all sympathize uh, in our strange modern world of Zoom, et cetera. Um, but we can send people who are here today links to a video of her making these two uh, cocktails that she was going to make for us. And uh, we just get to spend a little bit more time uh, with you, Fawn. Before, before we wrap up here, and some of us are, are before dinner and some of us are, are after dinner, you know, so we're either about to go eat and we're hungry or it's time for a cocktail, you know, one <laughs> or the other. Um, wh where do you come from? Because you just like, you know, you drop into this story, at least for us today, yeah. you know, sweet, generous, you know, okay, here's Vaughn. She reads the article, you know, and she goes running off to Tennessee. What were you doing before this apotheosis? Yeah, before this, well, the same thing I'm doing now. I have I have been for quite some time an investor in a number of brands. So even now, even though Uncle Nearest is is my main focus, I still invest in in other brands. I, I still invest in real estate. I still invest in quite a bit. And so there isn't a change on the investment side. The difference is, is prior to this, I have always done my best to be behind the scenes. I love it behind the scenes. So outside of being an author, outside of that, I was never, I never put myself forward. And the only reason I did as an author is, is you kind of, I set a goal to be a New York Times bestselling author. And so to hit that goal, I had to be out there and, and in, in the public. But for the business side of things, I've never been out front. And so one of the things that's interesting about this brand is one of the first people that I hired was a spokesperson. It was not supposed to be me. <laughs> I wanted to stay behind the scenes with strategy. And the team teases me that, that I keep trying to get further and further back behind the curtain, the more people that we hire. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely true. So what I'm doing now really isn't that different than what I was doing before. The difference is, is folks are seeing my face and the other difference is, is my full attention is on this one particular investment, although I invest in other things. This is where my focus is. Well, you know, I think it's a, it really goes to say, and what, and the thing that you were saying before about how long uh, wineries last, breweries last, uh, uh, people talking about a whiskey after a hundred years, I think there is something that is certainly true uh, and understandable about the fact that you hear about, okay, our brewery is 230 years old. Yes. Our, you know, our distillery is hundreds of years old. You go to cognac, you know, it's like, oh, we've been making, you know, cognac since the yeah. 1700s or whatever else. 
most businesses, they might come and go. There are not that many uh, businesses that will last, you know, 150, 200 years. And it turns out that a lot of them, a preponderance of them, you know, are making alcoholic beverages. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, you know, the table is the center of your life. I mean, whether, and we all have felt it this year, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a center of our life that we didn't even understand how central it was. And up until now, Americans have been famous for not making the time for the table, even though you know that 70% of the, of the best moments in your life happened around a table. Yeah. You know, and I think that trying to make, whether it's beer, whether it's whiskey, it's wine, it's sake, trying to make something that's worthy of people's time at the table, you know, is always a noble pursuit. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, a, you know, it speaks to the centrality, you know, of all of this in, in American culture and all of our cultures. Now, you know, I have a couple of thoughts to, you know, to, to kind of play us out here. Um, one of the main ones is that we want to know, you know, when you are drinking, okay, I know you're going to tell us that you drink Uncle Nearest Neat, and I'm sure this is true, but you must make some cocktails, right? Well, I make cocktails all the time. I actually Okay, so what are your I, favorite cocktails? Oh, yeah, I do it on my, on my Instagram and Facebook every single week. I make different cocktails. Awesome. So what, are I don't, what are your favorite couple of ones to make at home? It's just fun. Yeah, drinking. my, my fun favorite. Drinking. What don't you have it? My favorite ones to make at home is the first is, and I make it every Sunday. This is how we kick off our Sundays is the grown folk mimosa. I named it <laughs> because that's what it is. And it's essentially, if you take, if you take your traditional mimosa, right, your champagne and your, but I add in it a half of ounce of uncle nearest and a, of 1884 and a half of an ounce of grand Marnier the best mimosa you will ever have in your life. So that's my normal kickoff Sunday in terms of regular cocktails. I love a classic daiquiri swapping out the rum for 1884. I love a classic uh, sidecar swapping out the cognac for 1884. I love a penicillin, which is usually a scotch drink, but it is, I make it with 1884 in the float. I use 1856 to give it a little bit of that, that smoke that is at yeah. Top. And then my fourth one that I drink the most, uh, well, technically I keep barrel age old fashioned on tap at my home bar. So if you come over to my house, there's an uncle nearest barrel and it's filled with barrel age old fashioned. So that's always <laughs> given. Okay. Old fashions. You, tr you, you trend dry or sweet? I trend sweet. I trend sweet. Ooh, okay. I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> Anyway, like Listen, I'm, I'm a, I'm a anyway. sweet I'm tooth. Just... If you haven't gathered by every single cocktail that I have said, I, I, know. Look, I trend sweet. I made a beer based on the penicillin. I love penicillin so much. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that is a story, you know, for another day. Well, here's, you know, uh, uh, to play us out, what's, what's the, I mean, look, you know, you're an African-American woman. I know that people have walked past you at some point or other, despite the internet, when I started, and this is pre-internet, people would come to meet Garrett Oliver and walk right past me and say, hello, Garrett, to my very nice, uh, uh, you know, assistant, you know, who was of European heritage. And they, you know, they didn't even see me. You know, I was oh, no. invisible. And yeah. you know, he said, well, that's, you know, <laughs> and the Kurt happened to be from Stone Mountain, Georgia, so I'm sure it, it was not lost on him, you know, exactly that. And when, you know, when, when he'd point out, well, that's Garrett over there, people would fall all over themselves. Uh, now that's not happened to you in the same way, except maybe sometimes when you go into bars. And oh, I've never, I will tell you, I've never had this, I've never had this problem. I, I have a, 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 possibly unhealthy dose of confidence. Uh, when I walk, when I walk into the room, you will know who I am, not because I'm walking in and going, I'm Fawn Weaver. It's because I usually, when I walk into a room, number one, it's purposeful. I am not that person who likes to just be out and hanging. I'm a homebody through and through. If I, I mean, I know COVID has been awful on 
everyone, but let me tell you what I have loved is I've not had to leave my house. I get to see you all <laughs> here versus being in New York. I, I love this. So when I walk into a room, it is so purposeful that I am there, that people, even if they don't know who I am, they're asking, who is she? Because unfortunately, Black women, just in general, we, we usually don't walk into a room that confident if we're in a room full of people that don't look like us. And I walk into a room and I walk into boardrooms with white billionaires on a very regular basis. And as far as I'm concerned, we're toe to toe, we're equal. And, and so that has always been my approach. So I personally have, I can't say that I've come across that, that personally, uh, but I do know a lot of people that have. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, it's exactly that thing that my father taught me. I once did a beer and cheese tasting in the, you know, state dining room a few years ago at Althorp, which is, you know, Diana Spencer's estate, you know, 10,000 acres in England. And, uh, you know, Lord Spencer comes through and he's like, what's all this then? And it's like, well, we're putting uh, together the beer and cheese tasting. It's like, how are you doing? And whatever else. I'm like, you know, I was glad I was brought up in a way that like, I'm kind of like, nice house seems like a nice man yeah like but am i impressed like no but i do rather wonder where he got all this from <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i'm, <laughs> a, you know, I'm the same way ask too many questions well yeah. we're gonna wrap we're gonna wrap up here because we have uh we have whiskey and beer to drink and and food to eat nice. um but i want to i want to thank you for coming and spending some time with us if people want to find, uh, you know, your whiskey, uh, what is your, what is your, uh, the, the, the main website that you're going to, or do they just go to your Instagram page? Oh, they can go to unclenearest.com, N-E-A-R-E-S-T.com, plug in their zip code. I guarantee there's something within a couple of miles of them that carries Uncle Nearest. Awesome. You know, good to hear. Well, you know, we, we celebrate your success and, you know, we're going to want to hear more about this history. And I'll just put it, you know, one thing that you just said, and it's certainly true. People often wonder like, well, you know, uh, why aren't more African-Americans interested in beer? Why aren't more African-Americans interested, you know, in whiskey? It's like they are. It's like you're just not where they are. Imagine if every time you wanted a great beer, uh, every time you went out for, to have natural wine, Every time you wanted great sake, every time, every time, every time you walked into the place and everybody in there was African-American except for you. Yeah. It's like, well, would you be fine with that? Yeah. And you know what? It's OK to say no, no, you know, because that's weird. You know, Americans live in a, you know, weird segregation and still today. And when everybody starts, you know, getting the access to the good stuff and talking about it together, it turns out we're all in the same room together, it turns out to be a lot more fun, which is one reason why we ended up with prohibition, you know, because they did not want people all in the room together because uh, that they might figure out a few things about America <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and change some stuff. So we are going to, I'm going to say good, good night to you as, uh, uh, as they play us out. I wanna thank everybody uh, for being here. I want to thank you, Fawn, for, for your time and, and, and thank uh, 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 Sari and, uh, and Shannon Mustafer. I'm sorry that we didn't see her, but you'll get an opportunity to check her out uh, on a video via a link that we will send you. So, Mofat, take us out. <laughs>